Thank you. Uh, thank you all for, for coming to the presentation. Thank you very much for the invitation as well. Um, today I'm going to present some work I've been doing on um, the measurement of financial protection in health systems. Um, the first part of this presentation is actually joint work with Chris Millett and uh, Peter Smith from the Center for Health Policy at the Business School. Uh, and towards, it was recently published as a, as a policy piece uh, in the PLOS Medicine Journal. Um, towards the end of the presentation, I'm going to talk briefly about a few ideas I've just started to entertain the subject. So, you know, any comments, suggestions are more than welcome. So, okay, so um, financial protection is usually understood as the extent to which people are protected against the financial consequences of illness. Uh, as, as it's clear from the latest World Health Report, it's a key objective of any healthcare system, but one that is still elusive in many countries where financial hardship due to medical bills or lack of access to care due to medical costs are still widespread. Now, most studies point to the lack of financial protection being directly associated with health systems being uh, adequate risk pooling mechanisms and prepayment mechanisms such as social health insurance contributions, uh, taxes, year market for healthcare, and so on. And to make things worse, as you probably know, uh, the recent economic crisis has provided justification for some governments to increase direct payments for health, therefore probably damaging financial protection levels in the process. So monitoring financial protection seems crucial uh, for sound health policy, but the first problem that appears is how we can measure a concept that is multidimensional, such as uh, financial protection. So uh, the conventional metrics of financial protection, even though it's, it's a multidimensional concept, conventional metrics focus exclusively on the magnitude of direct payments for health, on the magnitude of the household's direct payments for health, and compare those to some measure of the household's living standard. So. Um, both, both the two main metrics, catastrophic spending incidents and impoverishing spending incidents, they are based on out-of-pocket payments as they are reported in household surveys. So specifically, catastrophic spending is said to occur if out-of-pocket payments for health care from, from a given household are above a given threshold in terms of the household disposable income. Uh, the threshold is normally set between 10 to 40 percent of what, uh, uh, of what the, the household uh, earns in terms of income. And then the incidence of catastrophic payments is calculated in that, po in that population, the population of interest. A second uh, popular metric has been to calculate the incidence of impoverishing spending, which is uh, the proportion of people pushed below a given poverty line due to medical care payments. These are the, main, the two main metrics, the conventional metrics. Now, these two metrics, uh, catastrophic spending and impoverishing spending incidents, they have very important limitations to provide a more rounded assessment of financial protection levels. I'm not going to discuss here a few of them. So the problems in measuring the true capacity to pay of households for, for health care, uh, the fact that these measures don't take into account the loss of earnings due to illness, don't take into account uh, coping strategies by households, so for instance, selling assets or borrowing money to pay for health. What, I'm going to focus here in this presentation is another very important criticism, which is both catastrophic spending and impoverishing spending are based on out-of-pocket payments as reported in household surveys. So they ignore the fact that lack of capacity to pay may lead uh, households to deter access to, to necessary care. And therefore, they report very low or zero healthcare expenditures and no catastrophic spending or impoverishing spending is recorded. Now, that, th these individuals are actually considered to enjoy adequate financial protection when they report zero health care expenditures because they can have access to health care because they can afford to pay for that. So this problem of access to care obviously is linked to the concept of equity in access, but it's also a very important indicator of financial protection per se because in most societies, if a person is unable to have access to necessary care because the costs exceed their capacity to pay, 
that person is not going to be considered protected against the financial consequence of illness. And that's exactly what an informative financial protection analysis should tell us. So, and even worse, I mean, if we focus solely on incurred out-of-pocket spending, uh, this, provide, this will provide a very uh, misleading picture, both for, of, of financial protection levels, both for, uh, to guide policymaking and, and also for uh, uh, international performance comparisons. So, to illustrate these issues in a very uh, simple way, I provide here, this is a scatter plot comparing the incidence of catastrophic health spending uh, in several countries, eight, seven countries, and their coverage for one particular intervention, which is DTP3 immunization. Uh, this acts here as a proxy for uh, access conditions, for financial barriers to access, which is something that is recommended in the latest World Health Report, for example. And what we can see here is if we focus only on catastrophic health spending incidents, an observer could conclude that citizens in Portugal, Georgia, and Uganda, they all enjoy similar levels of financial protection. They're judged by around 3% of catastrophic health spending incidents, despite a huge variation in access conditions. Uh, now, we know from the literature that the presence of cost barriers to access are, uh, the presence is very different between these three countries, and the problems are the same if we focus on countries with similar income levels. So, for instance, if we look at middle-income countries like Ukraine, China, and Indonesia, they all have very similar levels of, of catastrophic spending incidents, but a huge difference in terms of access conditions. And the same for uh, low-income countries such as Tajikistan, Bolivia, Kenya, and Nepal. And the picture is the same, the problem is the same if we use other indicators of access. So for instance, if you use skilled birth attendance instead of, of, of uh, GTP3 coverage, uh, uh, we, we face the same kind of picture. So very similar levels of catastrophic spending, but you can find uh, uh, lots of difference in terms of, of uh, uh, access conditions. Now, these coverage indicators obviously are more relevant for the case of low income settings because for most uh, develop, developed countries, they're going to be around 100%, right? But the problem is that if we look at indicators of financial barriers to access, direct indi uh, indicators of financial barriers to access, the problems are still the same. So for example, uh, here I sh some, uh, a recent survey found that uh, in countries with uh, very uh, low incidence of, of financial catastrophe, so virtually 0% of catastrophic spending incidents. Uh, all of these are very high uh, income countries. So the, the survey found that despite 0% incidence of catastrophic spending in countries like the US, the UK, and Germany, around a third of citizens in the US and around a quarter of citizens in Germany reported having been deterred from seeking necessary care due to medical uh, costs. This is compared to around 5% in the UK. So it would be very hard to make the case that American, British, and German citizens are all equally well protected against the financial consequence of illness, despite what catastrophic spending incidents tell us. I mean, it's 0% catastrophic spending incidents, but we know there is a huge difference in terms of access conditions. So my point here is that we need information on financial barriers to access to provide a more rounded assessment of financial protection levels. Uh, there is an emerging consensus on this uh, because one single indicator, such as conventional catastrophic spending incidents, is unable to capture the multidimensional nature of financial protection. So my objective here is to briefly discuss uh, a few practical alternatives to uh, complement, to improve on current financial protection analysis. And I would be interested in hearing any, any comments that you might have in any, uh, regarding any of these uh, alternatives. So the first one would be, uh, the first alternative to, uh, to improve on current financial protection analysis would be to complement conventional catastrophic spending and impoverishing spending indicators with measures of coverage for some interventions. So this is the route that is uh, recommended in the latest World Health Report. And it has the practical advantage that a few uh, uh, coverage indicators are available for most countries. So we can uh, perform uh, uh, comparisons over time for uh, 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 a high number of, of countries. But the problem is that the uh, indicators that are widely available in this, uh, from these uh, multinational uh, 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 institutions, so for instance, uh, immunization coverage or skilled birth attendance, they refer to selected primary care interventions, which are first more relevant in low income settings, but most importantly, 
they provide very limited insight into uh, the effects of financial barriers to access to more complex outpatient and inpatient care, which are linked to a higher probability of financial catastrophe for households. So this is one of the, of the problems. The other problem is this coverage indicators may be affected by many other issues in addition to financial barriers to access. So they, they, they may be affected by, uh, by, uh, by cultural barriers to access, acceptability barriers, uh, uh, and so on, and the health system uh, planning. So uh, there is the need, if we are going to use coverage levels as uh, in the, uh, proxies for access conditions to complement the financial protection indicators, there is the need to take these other barriers into account when you draw conclusions. The other alternative would be to complement these uh, financial protection indicators with information provided by access surveys. So uh, surveys that provide information on the uh, patterns and the reasons for the use and non-use of, of healthcare services. So I, I just presented the, a figure here which was based on uh, data from the Commonwealth Fund Health Policy Service which ask people whether they have been deterred from seeking necessary care due to costs or they have been deterred from following the adequate course of treatment because of, of, of costs. And many middle-income and low-income countries uh, have already run uh, household service which contain information on financial barriers to access and the reasons to, to uh, look for care. And this can be complemented with information from other instruments, such as the World Health Surveys, for, which were conducted in many countries, and the World Bank Living Standards Measurement Study, which also uh, have been conducted in, in many countries. Now, the problem here is that for most of these countries haven't conducted these surveys on a regular basis. So we need those surveys to be conducted on a more, uh, with more regularity if we want to perform uh, comparisons over time. Uh, and if we want to perform comparisons across countries, then there is the need to standardize the sometimes very different uh, uh, data collection instrument. So the questionnaires that are used and, and how uh, barriers to access are, are, uh, uh, are framed in the questions. So this is uh, one alternative. Uh, another alternative that I'm going to, uh, that we discuss in, in the PLOS piece is, um, would be to improve on current financial protection analysis by trying to adjust directly those measures, catastrophic spending and impoverishing spending, to adjust them directly for the presence of financial barriers to access. So this is actually one of my current topics of research. And the, the idea would be to use household survey data to estimate what is called uh, uh, need-adjusted measures of healthcare utilization and spending. So using population survey data, one can estimate uh, how much medical care a person would have received had they been treated as other individuals in that population with the same medical needs were treated on average. Uh, and this is done based on observable characteristics such as age, gender, and uh, whatever medical uh, information you've got from the service. Uh, so having adjusted the, the measures of utilization and spending for uh, the needs, uh, for the needs of, of, of each individual, then uh, we can construct uh, uh, measures of catastrophic spending and impoverishing spending that account for the presence of these financial barriers to access. Now, a couple of studies, they have provided very uh, uh, limited, uh, simple applications of this methodology, and what they find is that the policy recommendations can be quite different if we look at uh, the effects of financial barriers to access in addition to uh, observed catastrophic spending instance. So in the PLOS paper, we give the example of a study that was conducted in Indonesia uh, where it was found that more than a third of people reported zero healthcare expenditures and it was found uh, uh, a very common result that the poor tended to use far less healthcare services than the rich. So actually, the incidence of catastrophic spending was concentrated on relatively richer households, those who could afford to pay uh, uh, something for health care at all, uh, and it was due mainly to their use of inpatient services. So the policy recommendation, if we base uh, the policy recommendation on uh, conventional financial protection analysis based on catastrophic spending incidence, would be that the government should uh, uh, subsidize the use of inpatient services, which are actually used by the, the relatively richer households, and the inpatient services are the main culprits for catastrophic spending incidents. So let's focus on them. But when uh, the, these measures of uh, catastrophic spending incidents and impoverishing spending incidents were adjusted for the effects of financial barriers to access, it was clear that 
the cost of both outpatient and inpatient care tended to be catastrophic for the poorer households. And therefore, the recommendation of subsidizing inpatient services mainly had to be reviewed in light of the evidence that if the poor could make use of outpatient and inpatient services, they would face catastrophic expenditures as well. The problem is that they can't afford to get to the system because of, of the cost. So uh, it's, it's a methodology that has got a very, uh, it's very promising in terms of research, uh, but it's also, it's got a huge challenge in terms of, of how to, to take it forward. One of them is how we define what necessary medical care constitutes in any particular context. This one uh, important uh, issue. The second issue, uh, among others, is how to separate the effect of financial barriers to access from the effects of other barriers to access, like cultural issues or accessibility of health, uh, health services availability and so on. Because for this particular uh, financial protection analysis, what we are interested in is the effects of financial barriers to access. So ideally, we would like to separate that. So even though it's, promising, it's a promising methodology, there's still a lot to, to be done to make it operational for uh, 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 the analysis of financial protection and to, 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 to make it useful for, for policy analysis. So that's uh, uh, a second alternative. And what I'm going to talk now briefly, it's about uh, some work that I've just started doing uh, on another alternative to improve on, on current financial protection analysis, which is uh, data envelopment analysis. Uh, this is um, actually half of a, 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 a sort of a halfway between just looking at a bunch of coverage indicators and uh, financial catastrophe indicators separately, uh, or, uh, the, or using hardcore econometric work as, I, as I've just described. This is sort of halfway between these two. And the uh, DEA has been used historically in, uh, in the health economics literature to estimate the efficiency of hospitals. But here, what I do is to use it to estimate the efficiency of countries in generating financial protection for their citizens, given the available resources. That's basically the idea of what I try to do. So efficiency uh, in generating financial protection here is estimated in two stages. So first, a feasible efficiency frontier is estimated based on the observed inputs and outputs of countries in the sample. So the inputs are the constraints that countries face to generate financial protection for their citizens. So for instance, current levels of total, uh, of total spending, of total health spending, uh, the levels of income, GDP, for example. And the outputs are the uh, indicators of financial protection we are interested in. So for instance, uh, uh, catastrophic spending incidents, access indicators, coverage indicators, and, and, and so on. And the question we pose with this kind of analysis is, is which countries in the sample uh, achieve maximum financial protection performance given the resource they use for a given level of resource, for a given level of input. And one can then calculate an efficiency score for each inefficient country, which is actually the proportion by which that country could decrease their use of resources and still achieve the same financial protection level if we look at what other countries with similar uh, uh, conditions are doing. So that's basically the idea. So for here, in this uh, figure, I use only one input and only one output. And uh, the efficiency frontier is given by F here. So for the inefficient country P1, which is not in the frontier, one can calculate uh, the efficiency score, which will be given by the, the difference, basically by the difference between Q1 and QA, where QA is the level of inputs, resources, that P1's efficient peers use to achieve more or less the same level of financial protection. So that's basically what it is. So we're looking at what other countries are doing, similar countries, and how much uh, financial protection they achieve for a given level of resources. So we look at the, find the efficient countries, and then compare each of the inefficient countries to that frontier, and calculate how much they could uh, reduce their inputs to, to achieve the same level of performance. What are the advantages of, 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 of DA? Well, one of them is that you don't need to specify a functional form for this. This is estimated non-parametrically, so uh, just looking at the observed data. But the main um, advantage of this very simple methodology is just that it allows us to look at several inputs and outputs at the same time, which is particularly attractive when you're dealing with a multidimensional concept as financial protection. So if we think that we're interested in looking at financial protection, looking at different indicators, multiple indicators, that is a potential uh, methodology they can use to, to assess that. So I use 
finance uh, uh, DEA here to examine uh, how efficient developing countries are in generating financial protection for their citizens given the available uh, resources. So it gets at the issue of achievable financial protection. So we're not looking at financial protection you know, theoretically, but what can be achieved uh, given uh, the available resources, just looking at what other countries are doing. And to illustrate the method, I use only one input, which is total health spending per capita as a, as a constraint for countries. And uh, as outputs, as indicator of financial protection, I look at th three indicators. So I look at the proportion of people protected against catastrophic spending. This is 100% minus the instance of, of catastrophic spending. That's observed, that's a conventional measure. And I look at two other indicators which are proxies for uh, barriers to access, financial barriers to access. One is uh, a measure of immunization coverage for six interventions, and the other is the share of births attended by skilled personnel. And I have data here for uh, 58 uh, middle-income and low-income countries. Uh, this is mostly uh, from WHO. Uh, the catastrophic spending data comes from work by Ke, Shu, and colleagues. Uh, it's a bit dated, unfortunately. It, it runs from 1993 to 2003, but that's the, the available data. What, what interesting thing to note here is um, the low variation of the catastrophic spending data. So it shows that there is actually, in the sample, there is very little variation across countries in terms of financial protection levels if we look only at this particular indicator, right? So uh, this complicates the, the analysis if we uh, want to focus only on one indicator. So I'm going to start presenting the results for the group of top performers in terms of catastrophic spending protection. Um, and I'm going to show that the uh, efficiency analysis can provide very interesting insights uh, for countries that used to perform relatively well according to uh, measured uh, catastrophic spending incident. So, for example, Malaysia and Costa Rica here, they belong to the group of top performers, and they leave that group of top performers when we consider coverage indicators, access indicators, on top of catastrophic spending protection. So they were ranked here among the top ones, and they are now ranking 24th and 37th uh, uh, among 58 countries. Uh, and their efficiency scores indicate that their efficient peers achieve the same or better levels of financial protection using only 69 to 47% of what those countries spend in, in, in healthcare. If uh, we focus exclusively on coverage and forget about the sometimes unbelievably high levels of catastrophic spending for, for some countries, some of these countries drop even further in the rankings. And this is particularly clear for two countries here. South Africa and Namibia were the top performers in terms of catastrophic spending protection. That's what's in the observed data. But when we focus only on access to care, these countries drop to 56 to, and 49 uh, um, when looking only at access to care, and their efficiency scores here indicate that their efficient peers achieve the same or better levels of financial protection using only 10 to 16 percent of what South Africa and Namibia is spent in, in healthcare. And the, the same kind of efficiency analysis gives us some interesting insights into the performance of the worst uh, performers in terms of catastrophic spending protection, which are these countries here. So some of these countries actually perform well when we look at access indicators on top of catastrophic spending incidents. So for instance, this is the case for two countries here. Vietnam and Azerbaijan. So they were among the worst performers in terms of uh, catastrophic spending protection. But when we look at access conditions, when we put access conditions on top of that, they now rank first here. So th what this is saying is that you can't find on the, in the data countries that are more efficient in generating financial protection for the level of resources they've got. That's, that's what the, this, this is saying. So when you look at access conditions, those countries don't perform that badly. So that's what he's saying. And for other countries, it doesn't make much difference whether you include access indicators or not. But for other countries, it, they actually look worse when you look at access indicators. So for instance, some Latin American countries like Argentina, Colombia, and Brazil, they perform badly when you look at catastrophic spending protection. And they look even worse when you look at access conditions as well. So 
To illustrate the, uh, this is just you know, aggregate analysis, very simple analysis, but to illustrate the kind of results available for each country, I present here uh, the results for South Africa, which uh, you may, may remember is, was the top performer in terms of catastrophic spending protection, and which had an efficient score of only 10% when we look at access indicators. So the efficient peers were the Kyrgyz Republic and Tajikistan. And an efficient composite between the two, so a linear combination between these two countries, achieved the same or better levels of access, better levels of financial protection, but is spending only 10% of what uh, uh, South Africa spends in health, so $58 per capita compared to 561 And one important thing to notice here is that if South Africa were to become efficient uh, and spend uh, and, and, and spend what the efficient composite does, it would achieve the same level of skilled birth attendance, 82%, but it would achieve an even higher level of immunization coverage. So what this is saying is that even if uh, South Africa becomes more efficient in, uh, in, in, in uh, using the resources to uh, provide better financial protection, there is one particular indicator here which there is a potential further, uh, 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 a further potential for improvement. So, in terms of policy analysis, what this is saying is that after you adjust all your inputs, there is still some residual here that you can improve further. And uh, for policy, this, this can be uh, quite illuminating because it says uh, which areas the country can concentrate to, to uh, improve financial protection levels. And the same kind of analysis here uh, is done for Morocco, which was, again, one top performer in terms of catastrophic spending protection, but which had an efficient score of only 48%. So the efficient peers were Tajikistan and Vietnam, and an efficient composite would achieve the same or better levels of financial protection with only 47% of what uh, Morocco spent, so $56 compared to 117 And again, the analysis shows, this very simple analysis shows that uh, there is further scope for improvement for this particular indicator here, which is skilled birth attendance. So when you look at similar countries, what they are doing, you can see that uh, in this particular indicator, there is a lot of potential for improvement if Morocco were to continue to spend uh, $117 uh, uh, per capita on health. So what it is saying is not reduce your healthcare spending. It's saying well, how you can use it better. So that's what the, the, uh, the analysis is doing. Of course, it's a very simple analysis. It's something that is, is done. It shouldn't be taken as uh, 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 the final product of, uh, of policy recommendations. But it, the idea here is to show that we can use other techniques to try and complement what uh, conventional financial uh, protection indicators uh, are saying. So uh, I promised that I was going to be brief. Uh, so uh, that's what I'm going to try and do. So uh, this the concluding remarks, and I, I, I look forward to hearing if, if you have any comments. But to conclude, I just want to say that uh, this is not to say that there hasn't been any progress in recent years. So the development of, of uh, me metrics like catastrophic spending incidents and impoverishing spending incidents has been very important for us to try at least to, sh to, to uh, uh, take the spotlight to the, uh, the issue of financial protection. However, uh, the problem is that they've got important limitations, and the main one, uh, one of the main ones, is the fact that they are blind to the effect of financial barriers to access. So uh, we need to develop bet better methods of financial protection, and my idea here was to show that there are ways of going forward with this. Um, even though all the methods I discussed here have limitations of their own, um, we still can uh, try to improve current financial protection analysis by using them as conventional tools, as, as, as complementary tools. That's the, the idea. And hopefully, I have convinced you that uh, this is going to make uh, financial protection analysis more useful for policy guidance as well as for international performance comparisons uh, than they, they are today. So that's basically the message that I, I want you to take away. Thank you very much for, for your attention. Thank you.